Recognizing the need to provide direct answers to the public's questions about education prompted Commissioner Ambach to accept the invitation to appear on a live phone-in program. On the night of October 2, 1979, Commissioner Ambach appeared in the studio of WMHT Channel 17 Schenectady, New York, for a live phone-in program, which was carried by all public television stations in the state. The unique feature of the program was that the viewing audience was apprised in advance of the Commissioner's appearance, so they could call a toll-free number and speak directly with the Commissioner. The following is a recording of the live program and contains questions from viewers around the state and the Commissioner's response to those questions. Live from Schenectady, New York, call Gordon Ambach, New York State Commissioner of Education. Your host tonight is Steve Sullivan. Good evening. With us tonight to answer your questions is the Commissioner of Education for the State of New York, Gordon Ambach. Commissioner Ambach has been a member of the State Education Department since 1967, and he's been the Commissioner since July of 1977. Gordon Ambach is also the Chief Executive Officer of the New York State Board of Regents, a position which gives him jurisdiction over all types of education, including universities, schools, vocational programs, libraries, and the licensing of 30 different professions. Commissioner, nice to have you here. I'm delighted to be with you this evening. We'll be taking our call in just a moment, but first a couple of reminders. Firstly, in fairness to all our callers, we ask that you limit your question to the one you requested and that you be as brief as possible so that we may get in as many questions as possible. And secondly and lastly, please remember that you are determining the questions on tonight's broadcast. Our sorters, and we do have sorters, are only there to make sure that we don't duplicate subjects and that we hear from all parts of the state. Neither the commissioner nor I have any advanced knowledge of the questions to be asked tonight. So, commissioner, if you are ready, all ready. we'll have our first call. <clears throat> Good evening. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Binghamton, New York. Hi, Binghamton. Go right ahead. Uh, Commissioner, uh, in view of the high percentages of schools in New York State incorporating corporal punishment as a form of discipline, and I refer to uh, a study showing that 24% of school principals surveyed use corporal punishment, and 37% of uh, 60 school districts studied permitted it, and most of the children are usually in the younger age categories. Would you consider using your good offices as our principal statewide educational leader to review the matter? And if you find corporal punishment to be a classroom model of violence and a form of child abuse, would you call for banning corporal punishment from our schools? State law does not restrict the use of corporal punishment in schools in New York State. That's left to local school district jurisdiction. There have been bills before the state legislature that would uh, bar corporal punishment. I have not favored such bills, and I have told the members of the legislature so. I do, from time to time, sit on cases, on appeals that come before the commissioner where there may have been an abuse of corporal punishment and I rendered decisions on those cases. I think that the system that we have in place in the state, leaving local jurisdiction with the decision as to whether there shall be corporal punishment or not, is the right, uh, right way to do it. And I believe that our system of appeals to me uh, has been working properly in the past. Should I follow up? Y Surely. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would suggest, Commissioner, that uh, perhaps in this area, we do need some state leadership, and, uh, and uh, I would only appeal that uh, perhaps you would review the, the, the entire matter and, and, and reserve your judgment for a later date. I certainly am always willing to look at any additional evidence that there might be and uh, review it in that sense, but uh, I have no reason at the moment to change the position that I've taken. Thank you. Thank you very much. We do allow a follow-up question, if you wish. Uh, but only one, and make it a follow-up, please, not something entirely different. Good evening. Where are you calling us from? To our New York. You're on the air? Thank you. Go right ahead. What concrete evidence is there for nullifying the July 1979 state boards for nurses? 
And what reasons were there for not wanting to release the test scores from that test? The evidence that we have that caused us to void the nurse examination began coming in right after the examination was given back in July of 1979. The evidence was in allegations that was received uh, in several letters, many, many letters, about persons who had access to the examination in advance of taking it. After we received the scores from the National League for Nursing, the national association that does the examination and scores it, we checked those scores, and it was our unfortunate determination that there had been widespread access to this examination before it was taken. Those scores indicated that there were very sp suspicious results, especially with respect to those who had failed it the first time and then taken it and received very high scores later on. All of this evidence has been turned over, of course, to the BCI here in the state, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, and we have provided that evidence to the national investigation being conducted by the National League. Now, in voiding the examination, we had to take the step of barring the release of information for this reason. All of the candidates taking this exam have a limited permit to practice in the state. By law, once the results of the examination are made public, they can no longer have a limited permit. But if we are not using the examination to provide licenses and have voided it, and yet are releasing these scores which limit or void the limited permits, we would put all of those candidates having a limited permit in a circumstance that they could no longer continue to practice. It's for that reason that we have not released the scores and have no intentions to do so. We want to be sure that those having the limited permit can practice until they take the examination in February. Uh, Follow-up question, perhaps? Hello? Yes. Uh, um, why? would such evidence as letters count? If people say that they did not cheat, why doesn't that hold as much of an impact? We believe, of course, that the vast majority of persons who took this examination were not guilty of the security break, nor were guilty of any cheating on the examination. But the problem that we have is that there is clear evidence of widespread availability of the examination. In order to assure the public that each and every person who is licensed as a nurse has satisfactorily displayed competence on this examination, we have no alternative but to ask and to require that each person take it once again. I know that's a hardship on all, but we believe that in the interest of the nursing profession and protecting the public, it's absolutely essential that we do this. I thank you for your call. Thank you. Th thank you very much. The small beeps you hear uh, on the phone between or during the phone conversation is not censorship. It's an indication to us that there's another call waiting, as there is. Good evening. And where are you calling us from? I'm calling you from the vicinity of Valley Stream, Long Island. Hi. You're on the air. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Ambach? Sir. I know you have a monumental task of answering all the questions that are being asked, but uh, this one here seems to be bugging me quite a bit. Uh, and the question is this. In a central high school district that is comprised of three elementary school districts that would have four school boards to deal with, now, which school board or who is responsible for disseminating the details to the individual communities as to their total tax burden prior to budget voting time? As my school board only informs the community of the elementary school portion without including the portion of the high school, therefore the communities are in the dark, especially in my community, which is District 24. Well, each of the boards, of course, has a responsibility. Each of the boards has a responsibility for... The board has the responsibility? For information... The says no, that the high school has the responsibility, and the high school says no, that the district has the responsibility, and I seem to have a jurisdictional thing, and that's why I'm calling you. Well, maybe right now I repeat. Each of the boards has responsibility for its particular area, but then in sum and in total, you have uh, a consolidated responsibility overall. I think that in this particular case, uh, if there is a special problem, 
I would request that you might bring it to my attention, perhaps by a letter following up this uh, call, so that I could look into the details of that particular case. Okay, I would be very happy to do it. Fine. Thank you ever so much. You're welcome. Thank you for your you call. get a letter from me explaining the details. Thank you for your call. May I ask our, all of our callers to speak up? Some of the lines are a little bit faint throughout the state. Uh, I guess the line gets a little long when it goes to Buffalo or way out west. Uh, so please do speak up when you call us here. Good evening. You're on the air. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from East Meadow on Long Island, New York. Good to hear from you. Go right ahead. I'd like to ask the commissioner what is going to be done or is being done for the gifted students in New York State. These are our leaders of tomorrow, and they're left in a regular classroom, and they're quite bored with the traditional work. Now, there are a few programs I know that have been be uh, begun in the fourth grade, but that's really too late. They should have something starting in the kindergarten so that their potential will, not, will be developed and not uh, lie fallow. It's the, gift, the gifted and talented students that I think you're referring to. There are several programs that we have in the state which are focused toward the gifted and talented. There have been some state appropriations for some demonstration projects. But last year, the legislature asked our department if we would review the entire state, how many programs were being offered, what the cost of those programs were. We're just completing that report, and we will have for the legislature by November 1st a report on all of the gifted and talented programs in the state and the cost of those programs. We'll accompany that with some recommendations for legislation next year. I want to assure you that there's a very strong legislative interest in providing for special services for the gifted and talented. And I suspect that at the next legislative session, there is going to be a good opportunity for some additional assistance for these students in programs that will continue right from the very early grades all the way through completion or graduation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're speaking to the New York State Commissioner of Education, Gordon Ambach, and we're pleased to receive your calls. And you can do it by calling the number that is appearing on your screen. Good evening. You're on the air. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from Ghent, New York. Hi. Go right ahead. Commissioner Ambach, everybody agrees that the present means of financing schools via the property tax is unsatisfactory and inequitable. What are you, Commissioner Ambach, and the Department of Education going to do about it? May I call to your attention the important litigation that is now before the appellate division in our state? the so-called Levittown case. In that case, the property tax was challenged, and indeed the entire system of financing education in New York State was challenged. Decision was made in the Supreme Court by Justice Kingley, Kingsley Smith that our system of financing education was not constitutional. That's now being heard in the appellate division. Board of Regents and Governor Carey joined together to establish a statewide task force to review the issues before the court and to make recommendations on changing the financing system. One of the key issues being reviewed is the possibility of shifting to income as a base for wealth in the different school districts rather than property. Final decisions on changing our system of finance will really not occur until after the litigation is through the appellate division and the Court of Appeals. But right now, we're trying to get prepared to make recommendations for the governor and the legislature after that litigation is completed. That probably will not be toward the end of December in 1980. So it will be some time to come, but it's going to be that decision which really controls the way that we allocate resources and the, the wealth base that we use. Uh, a follow-up on that, uh, really? Commissioner. I'm familiar with this litigation. It's been going on for years, and uh, now you're speaking about in the 1980s. Uh, what disturbs us particularly is why cannot the Department of Education initiate uh, some means to provide for a more equitable uh, provision of equal education.
education for all the districts, which this uh, case has brought out in the courts, it strikes me that uh, you and the Department of Education uh, might take the initiative to speed up this process. Uh, I'm familiar with the Fleischmann report and all the other uh, things that have gone on in the past, but here we are going through years and years and years, and we've got the same thing perpetuating. Now, how can this be done? You're there in a position to do more than we are. What can you do and your department do to speed up this process? Well, I'm very pleased to have your follow-up question. Uh, I've commented on the litigation that's in process, but I hope that you'd be aware that uh, last year and this year once again, uh, we have advanced recommendations to the governor and the legislature which would very substantially change the formula for aid to the schools. And it would move in exactly the direction that you're speaking. It would much more significantly equalize expenditures by increasing state aid, being able to permit local aid to hold steady, increasing state aid, and getting further equalization. We have... Well, that's not a specific ingredient of it, but more equitable in the sense of the distribution of the funds with relation to the wealth base in the different districts. But we have taken an initiative on this, and I assure you that we'll continue. Thank you. Thank you for your call. Thank you. We remind you, please, to keep your questions brief. Uh, questions have been really excellent, but we need to keep them brief because we've got a lot of calls coming in. Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling us from? Sharon Springs, New York. Hi, Sharon Springs. Go right ahead. Uh, Commissioner Ambach, I would like to ask a question about sitting in or at least auditing classes at the State University in Cobleskill, New York. Um, I uh, was told that that was an impossibility because of the facilities at school would not be able to handle the amount of people that might want to audit. And uh, I would like to just make it very clear that the area we're talking about is an extremely small rural area in upstate New York. Um, I was also, at that time, uh, which was this last uh, spring, registered in, in that university. And <clears throat> because of my complaints to President Brown, uh, I was told that uh, I should not be on campus, and if I remained on campus, uh, they would, uh, you know, have me kicked off. So uh, it was an unpleasant experience for me, and I still never got my question satisfactorily answered. The school just does not allow audit or the ability to sit in on any kind of classes unless uh, you're fully registered and for full credit. I think the point that you're making is uh, really a matter of a local inst institution's jurisdiction. Uh, the determination as to who should audit a course or attended a course uh, at a particular institution, whether it be part of the state university or some other campus, is really a matter for that institution. It is not a matter for me to determine. Uh, I can understand that to a point, but I feel that if it's part of the state university, they have an obligation to the state residents, as any other state university does. I think if they're allowed to make whatever rules they want, that, uh, that's, a little, that's very haphazard, in my opinion. Well, I, I would agree with your general point, but once again, I think the matter of attendance at any particular institution really is a is that institution's uh, determination. Thank you very much. I hope that's helped. We invite your call. We're getting a real diversity of questions tonight. We are. Good evening. Where are you calling us from? You're on the air. I'm calling from Warrensburg, New York. Hi. State. Go right ahead. Uh, I'd like to know, is it legally possible to educate your uh, child, I'm talking about elementary education here, at home? And if so, what are the legalities and requirements involved so that the child would not be penalized later on for credit toward graduation? The Constitution and statutory provisions here in New York State do permit that a child may be educated outside of a formal educational institution. But there has to be an assurance that the educational program for that child is of equivalent nature and equivalent quality to the program that would be provided in the public school. By law, it's the determination of a local school board and the superintendent as to whether that program is equivalent to the school program. So it's possible. We do have that flexibility in New York. 
but there is the requirement that there has to be a demonstration that the child is receiving a, an appropriate quality program. Uh, how would one go about doing that? How would you, you know, find that out, whether it was uh, of equal quality? Would you go ahead and educate the child first and then have him tested? No, you would have to uh, have an authorization in this case uh, from the local school board and from the superintendent that in fact what program is to be provided would be of equivalent nature. You'd have to come up with the program yourself and then submit it for approval? That's correct. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our guest is the Commissioner of Education for the State of New York, Gordon Ambach. We're happy to have him with us to answer your questions. Good evening. You're on the air. Where are you calling from? Rochester, New York. Hi. Hi. Go right ahead. Uh, my question, again, regards the nursing examination mm -hmm. and the decision associated with it. And I'd like to know what alternative actions were considered by the commissioner and why these were discarded in favor of the action to uh, basically uh, indiscriminately void the results of the examination and rise uh, you know, up to 12,000 students. I'd be very pleased to respond. Uh, the decision that we made was a very difficult one, as I'm sure you would understand. We did weigh several alternatives to voiding the entire examination. We considered the possibility of voiding it for some and not for others. You uh, used the word discriminate or indiscriminate. Our conclusions were that if we attempted to try to void that examination for some but not for other takers, in fact, we had a discriminating circumstance. We could not rationally decide which groups or which individuals would be uh, permitted to use the result of the examination and which would not. It's a very, very difficult decision to have to move to voiding the entire exam, but we believe that in fairness to all, we must do that. Does that answer your question? Uh, partially. Uh, the examination was based on some form of statistical analysis. And I question why uh, the same statistical analysis could not be used to validate or invalidate the test and correlate uh, test results with academic records. Well, you can't do that exactly because of the fact that the candidates, some 12,000 in number, who come from so many different schools and so many different preparations, uh, don't carry with them an exact base of information that could be used to do this kind of statistical analysis. Even when you complete or you might complete some statistical analysis, we're still left with a very nagging problem that we know that there was widespread availability of this examination and yet uh, we cannot exactly determine whether a person had access to that or not. You cannot finally determine that even by statistical analysis. And we must in this instance, I think in the concern for the public and the safety and the integrity of the nursing profession, those who would be licensed because of this examination, we felt that it was absolutely essential to void it and then have an opportunity for all those to display their competence on another exam. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you'd like the opportunity still to question the Commissioner of Education, Gordon Ambach, please use the phone number that's appearing on your screen. That's the only number that works, and it's only for state residents, New York state residents. Good evening. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from South New York. Hi. Go right ahead. OK. This is Fred Gang from South New York. Good evening, Mr. Commissioner. Good evening. At present, Regents College scholarships for high school seniors are awarded on the basis of a geographic county-by-county county quota system, even though all candidates compete on the same SAT exam. If all potential New York State lawyers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, etc., compete evenly on a total statewide basis, why not region scholarship candidates? Good question. The requirements for the region scholarship program are, of course, established in state law. And you're quite right that there are quotas for each of the counties in our state. It is not a single competition statewide. And there's no longer a single scholarship exam as there used to be. It's now the result of the ACT or the SAT tests. 
that determine whether a student will win a scholarship. The reason for having quotas by counties is to provide that there is an opportunity, no matter what part of the state, what county you may come from, to have a chance at earning one of the college scholarships. And the legislature, in viewing this program over the years, has made a determination that there ought to be that spread of opportunity so that there would not be just a single statewide competition, but in fact a combination of a statewide competition and, if you will, a county com uh, competition. This would provide and does provide that there is that opportunity for scholarships to be awarded throughout all our counties and indeed virtually throughout all of our secondary schools. Those to be there as an incentive, a visible incentive, for students in every high school in this state. That's the reason why we have the quota system. I think it's a sound one. Okay, as a follow-up then, based upon your previous answers to the question about nurses' exams, mm -hmm. would you still favor a quota system for nurses then, for doctors, for pharmacists, for lawyers, etc., to have this equality of opportunity all around the state? No, I would not. The examinations have very different purposes. On the one hand, you're talking about a licensure examination to determine whether a person is qualified to practice in the state. On the other hand, you're talking about a scholarship exam, an exam through which we reward certain students for their capability and provide that extra boost toward college uh, education. I think they're quite different purposes, and it's justifiable to have a different base for awarding the scholarships. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You mentioned two tests. I wonder if you could tell us just what the, the letters mean. SAT is? That's the Scholastic Aptitude Test. And ACT is? That's the, that's the American Council on Testing Program Series. Okay. Students know them as SATs okay. and, and ACTs. They don't know the, the backup words. All right. Good evening. You're on the air. Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from the great city of the future, Buffalo, New York. Hi. Uh, Go right ahead. Sandberg. Yes. Uh, bilingualism is the subject. Mm -hmm. What is your view on it, and uh, to what extent does the State Board of Education believe in it? And also, what effect does that uh, court decision in Michigan have on the state? Does it have any influence on the state's thinking? Let me respond to the first two parts of your question. You may want to comment later on the uh, third part of the question. We have in our state a tremendous resource in that we have persons who have, by way of background, a native language which is not English. We have literally thousands and hundreds of thousands of persons in our state, and always have in New York, had this rich mixture of backgrounds and language. I think that what we should be doing in New York is definitely taking advantage of the fact that we have such a mix of backgrounds and look at bilingualism as an advantage and hope that, in fact, our students in New York can develop skills both in their native language, if it's not English, and in the English language. Our policies in the department and with the board have been toward promoting the development of bilingual education programs, of bringing students along in their native language and in English so that they could be truly bilingual. Again, I would say we have in this state a tremendous resource. We think of ourselves in our international setting and think of the potential for our economy and for world trade, for international activity, and we've got that chance to build a bilingual, a multilingual society where we can indeed continue to be a world leader and have the people who can work in our business and industry who need two or three languages yes, to serve. Yes, you would affect the producing uh, these schools become, uh, what these schools become towers of Babel, whereby instead of assimilating everything, you're actually uh, separating everything, everything so that people will need to uh, educate themselves more to, to actually uh, understand each other. And yeah. the thing is to lessen, not increase the, I, uh, the effect uh, of uh, language. I believe not. Uh, I do not support the development of monolingual programs in languages other than English. I'm supporting and we have supported bilingual programs, which genuinely mean that there is a competence gained both in English and in the native language well, of the student. Well, let me ask you another question. Sure. Well, we have a new wave of boatload people coming over, right? Okay, assuming that uh, uh, a, a 
large proportion of them are centered in New York. But does that mean that we're going to have another language instituted in the curriculum and that we have to understand another language and give them equal uh, right to the uh, use of their language? Uh, not, necess not necessarily, but there are, of course, certain rights which have been established by law now uh, to the effect of providing opportunities for those whose native language is other than English, an opportunity to be able to gain the skills in English uh, over time in order to have an equal educational opportunity. We want to continue to promote that. I'm sorry, we, we must move on. We've got a lot of phone calls. Thank you. Um, we do ask you to limit your question to the one you asked in your request, that you keep it brief, uh, and that one follow-up if you wish, but we've got a lot of calls, so that's why we're asking you that. Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling us from? Good evening. I'm calling from Gilderland. Hi. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening. I'm uh, one who believes that we're very fortunate in, in New York State that the majority of the people in our school systems are dedicated, very fine teachers who have nothing to fear from competency testing. But when you consider that in many of our so-called best schools, with 85% graduates college bound, which seems to be the measure mark, and in our elementary school, we still have the fourth grade teacher with tenure who ties an overactive child to his chair with a dog chain, and in the second grade, the teacher who hangs the sign reading nail-biting baby around a little girl's neck, and in the middle school section, we still have the teachers who cannot spell for board assignments. And in the high school section, we still have the teachers who believe that rotten language and sexually suggestive remarks make them popular with students. Considering these, Commissioner, will you, still, will you push for teacher competency tests? There are different types of tests. Uh, and when we talk about competency tests for teachers, it's important to know what we're, what we're, which type we're talking about. The key testing that is done with any profession is, of course, an initial test for licensure. In New York State, up to 1926, we had in place statewide examinations for purposes of licensure or certification of teachers. After that time, the system shifted so that there would be a determination of qualification on the basis of the college program. We have under consideration right now in the department and before the Board of Regents the issue of whether we should reinstitute an examination as a requirement for certification and licensure. Task force, which was comprised of teachers and administrators, task force which reported to our department, recommended such an examination. And I tend to favor such an examination as a condition of initial licensure. That's the most important test of competence for a teacher. Beyond that, I believe that the base responsibility for determining competence must rest with the local school district, the supervisor and administrators within that district, and ultimately uh, determinations by the Board of Education as to the competence of those who are teaching. Does that answer your question? Do I have a quick follow-up? Sure. Mm -hmm. Does this in any way, or will it in any way, incorporate a type of emotional competency to deal with children on a continuing basis? You certainly can't uh, test that by a paper and pencil examination. That is, the, that is the kind of examination, or that is the kind of evaluation, which really has to be a part of what supervisors and administrators in local school districts do. So that the, in the sense of having a single test or some statewide test, you cannot, in fact, measure that ingredient. You've got to rely on local school districts to make those determinations. Thank you very much for your call. Thank you. You're watching the third in a series of statewide broadcasts from Schenectady, New York, and our guest tonight is the Commissioner of Education for the State of New York, Gordon Ombach. And we'll go to our next call. Hi, where are you calling from? Chatham, New York. Hi, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm going to talk about competency testing, too. Mm -hmm. But in this case, the region's competency test, competency test and handicapped students. I'd like to know how handicapped students who, because of their handicap, will not be able to pass all parts of the region's competency test will obtain a high school diploma. In considering this very important question, 
we must uh, be sure of which handicapped students we're talking about. We have more severely handicapped students. We have students who have learning disabilities. Mentally retarded students. We have students who are handicapped by a physical handicap, but may not have a handicap in their intellectual capacity. Now, the Board of Regents have set as the guidelines and regulations for our competency testing program and diplomas, the requirement that all students must pass the competency test in order to attain a diploma. Students who have learning disabilities may take those examinations with special assistance. They may have certain parts of the examination read to them if they happen to have a problem of dyslexia. Or they may have certain mathematics examples which they can do with a calculator if they have difficulty in making those calculations without this kind of a machine. So there are provisions that we have to assure that a child with learning disabilities may have a fair opportunity to meet the requirement. But the requirement applies to all students. Uh, what I was specifically referring to is two of my children are deaf. And because of the nature of the vocabulary on the reading part of the comprehension, the reading comprehension, mm -hmm. I'm sure that they're not going to be able to pass it. The writing and the math part, I'm sure they'll fly through with no colors, no problems. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't see my daughter going to high school for four years knowing that when she's finished, just because she hasn't passed this one part of the test, mm -hmm. she will not be standing on the stage with the other students receiving her diploma. Well, may I comment about uh, special provisions as well for students who are deaf. For many, many years in our own state regents examination program, we have been providing special ways, special testing devices for children who are deaf. We also have them for children who are blind. I think that it would be very important for you to confer with your local school district authorities about exactly what kind of testing technique would be appropriate for your children. It is our intention that in the testing technique, we do get a legitimate, we get an accurate indication of the competence of the children. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. And if you're interested in making a request to question the Commissioner of Education, Gordon Ambach, simply dial the phone number that appears on your screen. That will get you in for a request, and we'll call you back. Hi, how are you? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Albany. Hi. Uh, Commissioner Ombach, my particular question deals with the uh, New York State Lottery. Uh, when this first came out, it was supposed to be sort of a panacea to education in New York State. And uh, I guess my question is, is the New York State Lottery, in fact, supporting education in New York State? The answer is yes. The funds that come in from the lottery, of course, uh, go into the general state treasury. There are provisions in the law that funds from the lottery, uh, to a certain extent, shall be applied to the expenditures for education. Now, in fact, uh, our state aid to the public schools expenditures come from both other revenue sources and from the lottery. And one can't exactly sort them out and see which dollar comes from which source. There is a guarantee, of course, by the state that there's going to be sufficient revenues from all sources for the state aid to public schools formula. A part of those come from the lottery, but that guarantee, of course, is not based just on what the lottery will realize. So the funds are being used for education, but they're clearly not the only funds. Uh, I guess there is a follow-up. Is there any way to ascertain what percentage of the lottery funds are being used for New York State education? Uh, the lottery tickets are still being sold, and our taxes still keep going up in regard to New York State education. Yes, that can be ascertained. I do not have uh, with me at the moment an exact percentage, but that could be ascertained. Okay, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. You really are getting a diversity of questions tonight, and some good ones, too. Hi, where are you calling us from? I am calling from Iceland, Long Island. Hi, how are you? Fine, thank you. Go right ahead. I must say, Gordon Ombach is much younger looking and better looking than I thought he was. But what I you want get two to questions. Say, pardon? <laughs> you get two questions. Yeah. What I want to say is, did you ever read the book Guide to Suburban Schools by the science editor of the New York Times? No, I'm sorry. I have not read that book. 
Well, it's fascinating. But I'm wondering why the Education Department doesn't investigate the high dropout rate in our small suburban schools of extremely gifted students. It would be worth looking into. In fact, I feel it's long overdue that we have a reverse malpractice suit in education. Johnny gets scolded for reading a physics book in seventh grade math, but drops out of the school. I commented earlier about the programs for the gifted and talented. Uh, if in fact what you're saying is accurate, that there is a significantly high dropout rate among children who are gifted and talented, then that surely should be reversed. I would hope that by state action and certainly by local action, that we could provide challenges and opportunity for gifted and talented children across our state and make sure that their priceless resource is well developed. Well, I would like to write you a letter and close some material. Would you accept it? I certainly would be pleased to receive it. All right, it's very nice. I won't talk anymore. Goodbye now. Thank Th you. Thank you very much. It's nice to hear that at the beginning of a oh, phone yeah. conversation. And very little makeup, too. Good evening. How are you tonight? Where are you calling us from? I'm calling from New York City. Right ahead. Okay. I'm a faculty member at the Lexington School for the Deaf, and this morning about 100 of us went on strike. The administration closed the school, telling our 350 deaf students to stay home. And my question for you is, as Commissioner of Education, what responsibility do you feel you have in helping to end the strike as quickly as possible? I am not familiar with the details of uh, this particular strike. I'm deeply sorry that it's occurred. Uh, there have been very, very few strikes, of course, in New York State this year. A principal well, response. Uh, one of the bases of our strike is that our salaries are 23 to 38 percent lower than other school teachers in this area. Mm -hmm. And the, our salaries are uh, state reimbursable. The, Although the school also does have private funds. And we were wondering if the state has any part well, in helping to end the strike. The state has a concern in two respects. One of them directly through my office and the other uh, would be primarily through the Public Employee Relations Board. Uh, matters of jurisdiction on strikes and settling those disputes are not directly with the Education Department. They are with PERB. And so uh, as far as any kind of direct assistance in arbitration or direct assistance on settling the strike, that's really in, uh, with the board. Uh, the other concern that we do have, of course, is one of uh, setting appropriate salary levels or reimbursements from the state for <laughs> teachers in schools such as the Lexington School. Mm -hmm. And on that, we have in the past made recommendations for uh, changing the regional uh, rates and distributions of salaries. Uh, those have not been accepted uh, through the budgetary process. Are but you referring to the Litchfield proposal? Well, I'm referring to proposals which would have provided a regional differentiation on the salaries. Uh, it's could you give any different. idea why they were defeated? Well, they were not accepted because of a concern of differentiation with other state employees' salaries and as to whether it was really fair to have this particular difference in uh, the salaries of school teachers and not with other state employees. That was the principal reason given. But I think there is an important concern here uh, I would want to familiarize myself more with the details of the strike, but I can report that uh, it has been my position in the past that we've tried to get an increase on that differentiation. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And you're watching the third in a series of statewide broadcasts from Schenectady, New York. Our guest tonight is the Commissioner of Education for the state, Gordon Ambach. Good evening. Where are you calling us from? From Buffalo, New York. Go right ahead. Good evening, Commissioner Ambach. Good evening. Um, teachers are generally the front line of defense for local educational systems. For example, in 1976, teachers were faced with uh, seeing art, music, and physical education uh, lost for the uh, kindergarten through third grade, having librarians cut drastically, losing a great deal of uh, reading support help and also having class sizes go up uh, a 
by a tremendous amount. We took a stand and went on strike. Naturally, we lost because of the Taylor Law, two days pay for each day we were on strike. We contributed about six million dollars to the local educational system, which then allowed them to put back the programs that we had fought for. So we actually financed them. Uh, a year ago, our contract came up again, and naturally we were quite weakened by that tremendous loss in salary, and we could not afford to take a stand again. Subsequently, many of these disasters occurred in Buffalo. What I'd like to know is, in light of the fact that we are off in the first line of defense, don't you feel it's about time to repeal the two-for-one penalty of the Taylor Law for teachers? No, I'm afraid I disagree with you on that. Uh, my position on the Taylor Law has been that the provisions uh, ought to stand. Uh, I do have a disagreement with you on it. Uh, Anything beyond? One follow-up? Yep. Uh, under the Taylor Law, the police and the firemen, at least when there is an impasse, are forced to go to binding arbitration. Under the Taylor Law, teachers, although not as essential as a fireman or as a policeman when it comes to public safety, don't have that option. In other words, they cannot be forced to go to binding arbitration. Don't you at least think that this aspect is unfair? I'm sorry, I'm going to disappoint you again with the answer. Uh, my feeling is that it, in this respect that the Taylor Law provisions ought to continue as they are now on the books. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Judging by the phones ringing in back of us, the banks of operators are still receiving lots of requests to question the commissioner. You can too by using the phone number that's appearing on your screen. Good evening. You're on the air. Where are you calling us from? Rhinebeck, New York. Hi. Hello. Go right ahead. Hello. When new or revised commissioner regulations are proposed, are public hearings held at which public comments are entertained? If so, how does your department publicize the upcoming hearings? And who may speak on the merit of the proposed regulations? If not, why not? Now, the answer is yes. Uh, we do, of course, have notice of uh, hearings on regulations that are going to be changed or any rules of the Board of Regents that may be changed. Uh, we, of course, have official notice that's posted with the Secretary of State and is in the register for the state. That's on any regulation that change that's going to be made, whether or not we are going to have a specific hearing on that one. On major issues, such as teaching as a profession, which is under consideration now, or on major issues like changing regulations for the post-secondary institutions, we have been conducting hearings across the state just within this month to get opinions from those who are professionals and from those who are interested but may not represent any particular organization. We are welcome. We welcome always comments from citizens and from those who represent particular organizations on our proposed regulations. If there's any particular area or set of regulations that you might be interested in, I would suggest you might drop us a note and inquire as to whether there's going to be any hearing in that area. Just a follow-up, uh, do you have to register in order to speak at the hearing? No, not necessarily. You. If you wish to be heard before the Board of Regents at a regular meeting, that does require a prior notice. But for a hearing, there is no prior notice necessary. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Our guest tonight in a statewide broadcast is the Commissioner of Education for New York State, Gordon Ambach. Good evening. Where are you calling us from? Is this mine, Scott? Yes, go right ahead. Where are you calling from? From Albany. Hi, go right ahead. Good evening. Good evening. Commissioner Ombeck, I would like, if it, it won't take too much of your time, I would like to hear some comments about the new Department of Education that has just been taken out of the HEW. How it, you expect it would affect education across the country, and particularly here in New York? I'd be pleased to comment on that. Thank you. The development of legislation for a Department of Education has really been long in coming in Washington. In fact, a lot of the debate on this issue, in my view, has sidetracked some of the concern on some very substantive issues that needed to be dealt with. I personally welcome the establishment of a Department of Education. I think that the President has wanted to have a Cabinet official who could speak for education very directly to the President, 
And I think that the establishment of the department is going to provide a focal point in Washington for activities in education. I do not believe that the establishment of a department is going to impede the operation of states or of local school districts or of colleges and universities and their activities. I do not believe there's going to be any kind of added control. The controls in federal education programs are really established by the Congress. They're in law. They are not necessarily matters of administration. So I welcome the new department, and I think that it's going to provide an effective forum in Washington for consideration of educational issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, these people are pretty good interviewers, aren't they? We're getting some they good questions. Are. Yeah. Good evening. You're on the air. Where are you calling from? From Bethel, New York. Right ahead. Uh, Commissioner, I uh, recently took the July 1979 nursing exam, mm -hmm. and I, along with others, would like to know what security measures will be taken for the February exams and future exams to assure us that this will not happen again. The, the examinations uh, for nursing are, of course, national examinations. So we have a concern for national security, and of course we have a concern for security within our own state. Because of the security break in the July exam, we have been in very close consultation with the National League for Nursing on the steps to be taken at the national level. And I can assure you that we are checking and rechecking every step of the process for the test administration here in New York State. I might point out that we have been for years administering examinations not only in nursing but in the other 29 professions that we license. And the incidents of breaks in security have been very, very few. I think this is an extremely rare exception, very difficult exception that we've just gone through, and I have strong confidence that the examination in the next time is going to be secure and going to give a good test of competence for those who take it. Thank you very much. Thank You're you very much. You're asking questions of the State Commissioner of Education in New York, Gordon Ambach. Good evening. You're on the air. Good evening. Where are you calling from? Uh, Levittown. Hi, Levittown. Yeah, uh, uh, Commissioner. Yes. Uh, is there any plan to increase funding to the instructional television program? I'm referring to the broadcast station, similar to the one that you're in right now, but for the daytime instructional program. The uh, last major increase in funding for instructional television and indeed funding for public television came in 1978, just last year. Very important new legislation that we advanced to the Senate and to the Assembly that would authorize officially the formula for distribution of funds and would increase funding quite substantially by more than two millions of dollars over where it had been. Those funds provide both for general public broadcasting and for instructional television. The continued application of this formula through this next legislative session would see an increase in the funding depending upon the resources that are available uh, to the councils for broadcasting because a part of this is on a matching basis. But I see now that we have a formula program in place, a steady, a regular and an important increase in funding, both for instructional and for public television. Uh, thank you. The natural follow-up to that is, is the State Ed Department going to go uh, to a program for uh, helping school districts get the equipment necessary to view the programs? You know, there are a lot of schools out there that don't have the facilities to receive the, these fine programs that are on. We have, in the past, not had a a categorical or an earmarked program for funding this kind of equipment, but we have uh, considered that the general state aid formula uh, and general state aid expenditures could be used for the purchase of such equipment. I would point out that uh, last year the state legislature increased state aid to the public schools by some 245 millions of dollars. It's a very substantial increase. Included within that, at a local school district discretion or judgment, there could have been expenditures for equipment to be able to match on to the programming provided by the public television councils. That's true, but unfortunately, I, I don't believe that school districts really understand the value of the program, at least school boards. Well, perhaps categorical aid would be more, would, would attract their attention more. 
Thank you for your, uh, you did a follow-up, I'm afraid, and we have to move on. We've got okay, very few fine, minutes thank left. You. Thank you very much. In fact, we only have about three minutes left in the program. We'll squeeze in as many calls as we can. Good evening. Where are you calling us from? From Albany. Go right ahead. Uh, good evening, Commissioner. Good evening. Should persons be permitted to teach in New York State public schools if the only complaint against them is that they are declared, declared homosexuals? No. Uh, there should be no bar, uh, and indeed by law there is no bar uh, to a person who is a declared homosexual teaching in the schools. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. We're still accepting requests, believe it or not, on the number that may be appearing on your screen right now, and uh, phones are still ringing to talk to Commissioner Ombach. Good evening. You're on the air. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from East Rochester, New York. Good. Good to hear from you. Go right ahead. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening. Uh, Commissioner, from the types of questions you're asking tonight, I know that uh, at times your head must be really filled. Uh, you certainly are, are feeling uh, quite a few difficult questions, but the reason for my call is just that. I want you to know, and I'm sure you realize, that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of excellent, dedicated teachers in New York, and that leads to me to my, to my question. The practice of recognizing excellence is quite prevalent in all forms of business, I think, in sports. But in education, we should recognize the merits of motivating towards excellence. But we do practically nothing in this regard for faculty and staff. My question, sir, why doesn't your office, the State Education Department of New York, make a more forceful effort to encourage or direct every single school district in the state to recognize excellence in teaching and to award and motivate superior teachers? Or don't you agree with that, sir? May I first join in your observation about uh, the resource that we have in our state in teaching. It's tremendous. Uh, I was a teacher in New York State. I'm very proud of that fact. I was a president of a teachers union in New York State, and I'm very proud of that fact. Uh, we have a tremendous resource here. And I agree with your observation about being sure that we have rewards for excellence. I think the determination of those awards has really got to be at the local school district level. I, I'm sorry, but we are out of time. Thank you very much for your call. Um, when we run out of time, we simply run out of time, I'm afraid. And before we completely do, I want to thank the people who, all of you, who took time to call in to tonight's program and made the questions, to all the volunteer operators behind us who helped us, and especially to Commissioner Gordon Ombach, who appeared with us tonight statewide. And we've got about a minute left. Perhaps you have a comment or two on the telecast. I'd like very much to make a comment. I join you in your thanks to all who have assisted in this program. It means a great deal to me to be able to have this kind of direct contact to get a sense of what's on the minds of those who are in New York with respect to education and to be able to respond directly to questions. I've been all across the state in regional conferences doing this, and this is a great opportunity through public television to do the same on a statewide basis. We have a tremendous resource for education here in New York State. We have it in our formal institutions and we have it right here represented in public television. I'm very pleased that I've had this chance. I hope there's another opportunity when we can do the same thing again and feel these good questions about education in New York. We do too and it's been a pleasure and we thank you, Commissioner Ambach. I'm Steve Sullivan. Good night from Schenectady, New York. <laughs>